before you. We lay our lives before you. Thank you, Lord, for being so kind and so good to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for sending your darling son, Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for thinking that we were worthy enough, Lord, that you would come, Lord, from the perfect place. Come, Lord, or down into this dying and desolate world and give us a way back to heaven, a way back to the, our Father, a way back to our home. For, Lord, we are strangers and foreigners in this land. But you love us so, Lord, that, that you made a way out of no way, Lord. And we thank you for it, Lord. And, we, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this hour. And we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be on the land of the living one more time. Bless everyone who's come, Lord, and bless everyone who's on their way. Lord, uh, give us strength, Lord, for, Lord, we know all our strength, Lord, comes from you. Our hope is in you. Our strength is in you. Our courage is in you. Our confidence is in you, Lord. Our healing, Lord, comes from the true and the living God. And thank you, Lord, for carrying us every day of our lives, Lord. Lord, you bless us so. You anoint us, Lord. And you, you show your favor on us, Lord. You give us homes to live in, food on our table, Lord. You give us clothes on our back, Lord. You give us cars to ride up and down the dangerous highway, Lord. And you keep your hand of protection on us, Lord. And, Lord, you give angels charge over us that we may not dash our foot against a stone. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you give. For we know that he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And Lord, bless us uh, today. Uh, bless our pastor today, Lord. Crown him, Lord, from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, Lord. Give him wisdom and knowledge from on high, Lord. Lord, put words in him, Lord, that bring comfort to your people. And um, bless us, Lord, as we come, Lord. We come, Lord, with open minds and softened hearts, Lord. Uh, please, Lord, remove the stony heart that's in us, Lord. Remove it, Lord, and replace it with a heart of flesh, a heart that can be molded and shaped and conditioned, Lord, to hear the word of the living God. Bless us, Lord, and keep us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, say amen. Come on, church, say amen. Say hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the service one more time? Come on, look at somebody and say, I'm glad to see you in this service. Hallelujah. Just one more time, God. Glory to God. We bless you. We thank you, Lord. For all you do and all you've done, Lord God. Come in and stop with us. Stand with us. I know this is the season. Somebody say the season to be jolly, the season to be happy, the season to be out of spirit of giving because God gave his only begotten son. And through him, we might live in eternity with him glory and majesty. So we ought to thank God for that. How many grateful people? How many grateful people? Hallelujah. We got to live. Come on, we're going to say nothing new. We're going to say. Out those old CDs. Glory to God. Turn to their favorite radio stations. Hallelujah. And listen to those good old Christmas songs. Hallelujah. Some of them, how many of you know some of them ain't all church Christmas songs? <laughs> yes, God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So he is good. Come on, sing with us.
know this one. Come everybody, come everybody, come here and say, come. Clap our hands on this one right here. This is a clapping thing. Oh, yes, God. He said, what a night. Somebody said, what a night. What a beautiful night it was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say, you know, what about tonight? But it was that Jesus was born. Our salvation was born. Hallelujah.
That's all you know what to say. Just hold on. There's nobody like you. Just take it by yourself and say, oh. few announcements for you. On Tuesday and Thursday of this past week, the pastor met with his leadership team, and there's going to be a few changes in 2023. 
We're going to make sure you get those changes in your hands next Sunday. Those changes will be posted in the foyer. And those who do not, that will not be in service next Sunday, we will personally mail those changes to them. We are excited about what the pastor has in store for us in 2023, and we hope you will get on board and be just as excited as we are. Hallelujah. Amen. A reminder that our Christmas banquet will be next Saturday, December the 17th at 6 o'clock p.m. If you have not signed in or registered, please do so today. We need to have a number count and we need to know if you're bringing a guest. Now, if you are bringing a guest, it will cost them $5 per person. So please have your funds in hand, or you can go ahead and pay those funds to either uh, Brother Victor Gillum or Sister Vanessa Prentice. A reminder of our capital campaign, fundraising. We ask everyone to please be visual and you know, you made a promise that you would do this, and we're hoping that everyone will go ahead and start, if you have not, uh, your $1,000 pledge. Our thought for the day. We all know what Christmas means to each, to each other, to your, yourself personally, to your family. Let's be generous this Christmas. You know someone out there that may need a little help. Put a little ch chump change, I, uh, no, no, just folding material, no jingling, just some folding material and a little card and hand it to them. Make their Christmas special. Remember the reason for the season. It's not about shopping. It's not about just being selfish. It's about giving. God gave his son. We ought to be just as giving because he has given us a spirit of giving. And if you are excited about Christmas as I am, you will start today. If you don't do something each day for someone, do something every other day. Okay? Okay. Enjoy your Sunday evening. Thank you. Let me say good morning to everyone. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. And the Bible declares we shall rejoice and be glad. And are you glad to be here this morning? Amen. Amen. We are just grateful to be here this morning to share with you in the grace of God as he continues to guide us and lead us. Listen, God has been more been good to us. You, you are here about to enter a new season, a new era, uh, and you ought to be excited that you made it this far. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You should have been dead sleeping in your grave, but by the grace of God, here you are this morning to celebrate the last second Sunday where we come together and commune together as a family, as one body in the house of triumph. Amen. So, so as we're entering into this season, you all, as we're moving from this place into a new paradigm that God is about to shift us to, I'm encouraging you that you would recognize what God has done for you personally. Look back over 2022. Look at what you've gone through to get to where you are. Recognize that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, come on somebody. You didn't do it because you were so smart. Come on somebody. It wasn't because you were so good and then you were the best person in the world. It's because the grace of God 
that you are here sitting in this place on this morning. I wonder, do I have any witness in this place? Come on, come on, Triumphant. This is our last second Sunday. We ought to give God our very best. He's worthy to be praised. Listen, it ain't about you liking me. It ain't about me liking you. It's about what God is doing. Amen, somebody. It's about how God has authentically held back the hand of death and held back the judgment that he should have given us, that he wanted to give us, but because of his mercy and Jesus' blood covering us, it didn't happen. And we ought to be thankful to the Lord and let the Lord know how much we appreciate it. Amen, somebody. Amen. Now, here's what I want to do before we give our communion. I, I want to take a moment, Brother Victor, and just, just if you will, just give us a, a, just a few seconds, a few minutes of worship. And I want everybody in this place to stand and just in your own way, just express to God how much you appreciate what he's done for you in 2022. If it's running, you do it. If it's clapping your hand, you do it. If it's you praying, you do it. I just want you to let God know how much you are grateful and thankful for him being as good as he is to you because he didn't have to do what he's done. He's good and he's better than good. Hallelujah. Come on, Brother Victor, give us some music. Hallelujah. He's worthy. God is worthy. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated in the presence of God. Thank you. Amen. He is good. All the time. Not some of the time, so good. but all the time. He is good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We ask now that you just take this moment to transition your minds from the cares of the world, from the things that may be hindering you from seeing God on this level, that he is good. As we prepare to enter to this most holy place and solemn place before God and known it, and as we worship it and use the word of God as a place where we worship him in spirit and in truth. But yet we come here because we want to carry out one of the ordinances that was left for us to carry out, and that is the Lord's Supper. 
I want to read this to you before I proceed forward because uh, the Lord really just gave me some valuable information to share with you all. And I just believe it's, it's relevant for this season that we're in. Hallelujah. The book of Exodus chapter 12, looking at verse number 43 down to the following verses. It talks about uh, the Passover speaks in reference to why we do what we're doing now and it gives the validity the foundation as to what Jesus did as you read the gospel but most important uh, the Luke the book of Luke uh, as I will turn to in just a moment and share this with you uh, but Exodus 12 verse number 43 I want to read this to you and I want you to hear what God instructs Moses and Aaron as they institute what is called and is known in our era as the Passover. And it says, and the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourn among you. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass the self same day that the, that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. I want you to, to recognize two important places of, of words here. Number one, circumcise. Okay? And I want you to capture this because, see, God sends and uses the same presidency in our era. An unsaved person should not come around this table and participate. Uh, this table, this gathering that we're in is for the saints. If you would notice clearly what he said in verse number uh, 44. But every man's servant that is bought for money when thou hast circumcised, and then shall he eat thereof. Verse 45, for a stranger and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. It is important, sisters and brothers, that you understand that God takes seriously when we come around this holy table that we recognize how and who should participate and partake in this setting. Turn with me quickly, if you will, to Luke chapter 12. I want to share this with you as we move forward. Luke chapter 12. Excuse me, chapter 22, not 12. 22, forgive me. Luke 22, turn with me quickly. I want to look at starting at verse number 14. As I read this to you quickly. Verse 14 says, And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, that he is Jesus. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover. Notice the term that he uses. This Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourself. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup 
is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Hallelujah. Turn with me, last is the first Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be through. Paul says here in first Corinthians chapter 11, as we look at verse number 23. Paul says, for I've received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, uh, that the Lord, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, listen to this. Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, for this cause, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest I will set in order. My sisters and brothers, Jesus gives us strict instruction that God the Father had established during the time of the Israelites. It is important that you understand that the Passover pointed to the Lamb of God that will remove and take away the sins of the world coming onto the scene. Christ is that sacred Lamb, that Lamb that was killed. He is the Lamb that should, the Bible declared that could not be broken. That's why in the Old Testament, when you read, I read to you in Exodus 12, that no bones should be broken. It was pointing to Christ Jesus' bones never being broken. Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He who knew no sin, but because of sin, became sin for you and I. And I'm grateful this morning that you and I have a revelation and understanding that anybody that's not unsaved, if you are not saved, notice that Jesus had this setting with his disciples and not with the world. Pointing to this about the body of Christ coming together and we come together, tarry one for another, and we collectively eat the bread and drink of the cup together because it's about God's son, Jesus, who is the Lamb of God that has taken away the sins of this world. He died that you and I might be free. And because of this, we ought to give our all that we can serve him in spirit and in truth. We worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? So as you come now around this table, I ask that if you have sin in your life and you know that you do, take this moment and ask God to cleanse you and wash you that you may be worthy as you partake and participate in this setting that you don't eat and drink damnation unto your own soul because it won't affect the Lord's body. We ask that you do this and that you follow the word of God and be obedient. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God is worthy to be praised. Amen? Hallelujah. As we come before you now, we ask that you will bow your heads. Father, we thank you now for this opportunity as we come before you. We ask, O oh God, that you make this moment in time sacred, holy, set apart from all the worldly ways that as we come around and participate and partake of this moment, that God, we bring glory to your name. This time is not about us, but it's about your son who died on Calvary's hill, gave his life that we might be free. And he's now residing on your right hand with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. 
Oh, God, help us to clearly understand the magnitude of this setting in this moment. And, God, you said that on that day you were going to drink from this fruit, uh, the wine, and eat the bread in heaven on that great day. We look forward to it, and we honor you, and we thank you, and we ask that you bless us now as we observe and obey your ordinance that you instituted with the nation of Israel as they prepare to exit Egypt. Thank you now. In Christ's name, for this moment in time, amen. Hallelujah. We ask that you stand now, that you proceed from my right to my left. Hallelujah. The choir first, membership, and then officers will be last. In Jesus' name.
is to our God. He's worthy this morning. Hallelujah. Every word. Come on, bless our music ministry. Come on, encourage him. Amen. We thank God for them offering and lifting their voices to give God honor and give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. We are grateful this morning. Amen. Listen, uh, I want to bring to the podium a uh, brother that I met in Egypt, excuse me, in Israel when we went on the Israel trip. He and I room together, and he's been here multiple times, but he's like my big brother in the ministry. Uh, he's always sharing with me. He's always encouraging me. He's always giving me words uh, that helps me continue the journey that God has called me to and called me on. And I'm just elated that you all. Let me just share with you, and then I'll allow him to expound on it when he comes to the podium, but he's about to transition to South Africa, him and his family. They're moving to South Africa, and he's becoming the CEO of one of the major in Bible institutes in South Africa. And, uh, and I just didn't want him to leave the United States without giving us a word uh, in season. He's going to be moving his entire family, then that's where he's going to be living. And, uh, and I, I asked, I said, man, could you stop by Triumph? He said, brother, I'd, I'll be there. So Bishop Joseph is a true friend of this ministry. He is a true brother that I would encourage. If you're looking for somebody to walk with, that's the brother. You know, you can't say that about everybody who got titles, who got names. But I can tell you if I can call him any hour of the night and say, Brother, I need you. He won't turn me down. He'll be there for your pastor. And he'll do all he can to ensure that your pastor receive what he needs. So as I transition from the podium, uh, the pulpit, I ask that you welcome him with a warm of applause, Bishop Henry Joseph, as he come to the pulpit. Young folks, quietly, as you're exiting to youth church, go quietly with the first lady. Come on, encourage Bishop Joseph as he comes to bring us the word for today. Come on, come on, stand to your feet. 
Come on, stand to your feet. You can do better than welcome him as he come to give us a word as he prepared to lead these United States of America. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, bless the Lord. It's good to be back home. I feel uh, so comfortable behind this sacred desk that I've uh, had the privilege of speaking from so many times. And I echo the words of Pastor Jones that he is a, a dear, dear brother in the Lord. And uh, to authenticate that, he called me earlier in the week and said, brother, I just feel like you need to come and share with us before you leave. And I took a pause because I'm actually leaving tomorrow <laughs> at 12 o'clock. And I'm like, uh, but this is my brother. So I said, uh, yes, definitely uh, I will be there, not just to be a blessing, but to receive a blessing. And I'm not talking about honorariums or anything like that. I'm talking about friendship brotherly love and a connection with this congregation. Can you say amen? I don't know when the last time I was here, but I just want to talk to you for a minute because the last two years, I think for everybody coming out of this pandemic, really the last three years was at least for me, one of the most difficult seasons in my life. I was in a horrific car accident uh, about three years ago, no, two years ago. And uh, like many of you, I had COVID uh, really bad, as well as some other challenges. But as I'm gonna be sharing this morning, and I want you to hear me good, in the midst of everything that I was going through, I never lost my worship and I never lost my praise. And because uh, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us not just to praise him. And this is going to be part of the message this morning. He doesn't want us to just praise him when good things are happening. Uh, I'm not going to say too much more until I get into the sermon, but let me share what God is doing in my life. As Pastor Jones uh, mentioned, I am moving back to Africa. The only thing he made a mistake is, and it's not his fault because for the last Six months, I've been traveling all over the world. I think I've been to Egypt, Dubai, South Africa, Malawi, and a few other major cities here in the U.S. But I'm moving back, and when I say back, because I lived there for seven years, I'm moving to a small country called Malawi. And it's in the southern part of the continent. And I got to share this, this testimony before I get into the sermon, and I'm not going to be long. Uh, pastor only gave me about three hours, and I want to use my time wisely. Um, back in 1999, I went on my first mission trip to Malawi to um, help build a mission clinic on the campus of African Bible College. And the president at, at that time, who we became very close friends after that, he would often mention that uh, Henry came to Malawi and he spent two weeks on his knees. And it gave the impression 
like I went to Malawi and I was praying for two weeks. When reality, I was laying floor tile in the clinic. I was praying, but uh, I was laying a whole lot of floor tile in that clinic in 1999. 23 years later, now this is how powerful God is. 23 years later, I'm going back to the same ministry to be their executive director. That the president passed away unexpectedly. The board contacted me, and after some discussion, they asked me to go back and to serve as the leader of that ministry. Now, what's powerful is that ministry has grown tremendously since then. Um, it's a MBA program, mul multiple bachelor's program, an elementary school, a middle school, a high school, a hospital, an emergency ward, a ear, I mean a hearing clinic, an eye clinic, a maternity ward, a re three radio stations, and a TV station. And as soon as I get there, I, got, I have to supervise the construction and the development of what I call is going to be the best STEM high school in all of Africa. Now, I've been here many times. Y'all know my story. I'm just, I'm just a hood rat from Compton, California that got radically saved and healed, and God has now put me in a position that I'm not, just like everything I've done in life, I'm not qualified for it. I have no experience in it. The only reason that I'm going is because God is sending me. So I'm, I'm greatly privileged and greatly honored that Pastor would invite me to be with you today, the day before I leave. And we're probably going to be gone at least for a year to start, and then we're going to make a decision after that. So I solicit your prayers, and if you ever want to come to Africa, you have a friend that you can trust, because some of y'all scared. <laughs> but you got a friend that you can trust that will make sure that you are well taken care of. I honor you, man of God, for your friendship, your encouragement over the years, ever since we spent that time in Israel. Give your pastor a round of applause. I'm going to get into this word, and I'm not going to be long. Actually, I'm, I'm kind of exhausted this morning. Just all the tasks that uh, I'm embarking on in preparation for leaving tomorrow uh, because time uh, doesn't change. Yeah, when you have a deadline, you can change a lot of things. But you cannot add no minutes, hours to your day. And that, that'll preach all in itself about the sovereignty of God. Here once more in Scripture, particularly this Scripture, is one of the most glorious staggering words in all of the Bible. The Apostle Paul, again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, puts into words one of the most wonderful, surpassingly great statements of the Bible. 
And you can turn there, it's in Ephesians, the first chapter, that the Holy Spirit gives Paul the ability to use 23 words to unlock and unleash one of the most awesome truths of the kingdom of God. We must, therefore, approach this scripture like all scripture with the utmost reverence because it puts in a capsule the very essence of the gospel and the life thereof. It demands our sincere and utmost attention. Lastly, as I read these words, listen to me, don't just be impressed with the statement made or the verse that I'm going to read. But with all your heart, listen to me, all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your spirit, listen to these words as one of the most profound truths that can be found in all of creation, in all of existence, and in all of eternity. Just going to read one verse from chapter number one of Ephesians, verse number three. Listen with your heart, your mind, your, your spirit. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm going to read it again and even meditate on it as I read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all some, a little bit, enough to get by, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, where? In heavenly places, in Christ. Father, thank you for this profound word. Holy Spirit, I can only unlock its profoundness, its power, its revelation only if you help me. So not only help me, help your, your sons and daughters also to understand the depth and the width and the height of this word. Father, if I say anything that is not of you, let it fall to the ground and die never to live. But if it is your word, let it bring life and life more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So after Paul... Uh, having introduced himself in verse number one as an apostle by the will of God. <laughs> and I tell you, I got to stop there already because there's so much distortion in the body of Christ in regards to that word apostle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the traits of what makes someone who is following in the apostolic tradition. Because the first thing I want you to know, what the scripture says that Paul was an apostle by what? The will of God. Not self-appointed, not the congregation now appoints their pastor an apostle, not because people think you're an apostle, not because the pastor loves that title, 
but it is the will or by the will of God. Secondly, there are no apostles. We follow in the apostolic tradition and the anointing of the original apostles because in the New Testament, it clearly talks about the apostles laying hands on those who they felt were worthy of the apostolic anointing. And generation and generation and generation because the anointing is tangible and transferable. Hear me. The anointing is, is tangible. It, it, it is something. It, it is something you can feel, you can understand to a certain extent, and it can be transferred to another person. How do we know that? Because when the major prophet died, Elijah died, they, they put him in the traditional grave, and years later, there was a conflict, and, and, and Israel had to hastily bury some men, so when they put this man next to Elijah's dead body, the Bible says that the anointing on Elijah transferred to the other man, and the man came alive. Because the anointing is tangible and transferable. So the anointing that was on the apostles has been transferred from generation to generation. Three signs of the apostolic anointing. First, and this is modeled after the original apostles. So when you hear somebody call themselves an apostle, look for these three things in their testimony and in their action. First, they've had a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. I I'm not talking about a revelation. I'm talking about seeing him. And when you see him, you will know it. <laughs> I'm not talking about the, 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 you know, the nice little feeling and, and a little revelation and I feel, no. I'm saying that you meet Jesus because all of the original apostles had face-to-face -face contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, even Paul. Secondly, an apostle doesn't have a local influence. He has a regional influence. The Bible says, using Paul as an example again, that when Paul showed up, the Bible says that he turned the city upside down. He, he didn't turn the church upside down. He turned the whole city upside down. When he wrote letters to Rome, Rome was the most powerful kingdom, earthly kingdom on earth, but they were shaken by Paul's words. The third sign of an apostle is that they have, they have an extraordinary depth of the revelation of God. How do we know that? Well, again, read Paul's reading. He was an apostle. And l read Romans. Supernatural revelation. Extraordinary re revelation that you normally don't hear. So those are the three things, the three signs of the apostolic anointing. Seeing Jesus, meeting him meeting the manifested Christ, having a regional influence, 
in having extraordinary, deep revelation that you can communicate where people can understand. That was my first introduction. But I'm not going to be long. So, Paul introduces himself in, in, in verse number one, and I had to stop and, and share that. And then he reminds them of the grace and peace that has come from the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. And then here in verse three, all that he is trying to basically say to the Ephesians is to put into one, into one verse. Now, if you really break Ephesians down, it's really in two parts. But in this verse, he's able to bring it all together in one verse. But in Ephesians, in the first three uh, chapters, Paul describes who you are in Christ Jesus. Because he uses that phrase a whole lot, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. All what you have in Christ, in Christ. And then in the second three chapters, he then shares what to do with that knowledge. Amen. And I want to try and do the same today. With the two hours and 40 minutes I got left. And what is he trying to do and what I'm trying to follow in his footsteps is to get you to see three things. Who you are, what you are, and the great blessings that are open to you. Now, a lack of knowledge has always been one of the hindrances to the moving of God's people forward. Paul is dealing, I'm not dealing with it, Paul dealt with these people who were knowledgeless. They didn't know who fully they were in Christ Jesus. But because it was a new revelation, it was a, a new religion that had been evolving over centuries, he had to teach them all that was in their possession. And that's the message of the prophet Hosea in the New Testament when he says in chapter 4 verse 6 that God's people were dying from a lack of knowledge. That's powerful. And I, I don't think he's just talking about physical death. It could be included in there, but certainly he's talking about spiritual death that, that people were dying not from, oh, this is crazy. They weren't dying just from diseases, accidents, and things like that. They were dying from knowing knowledge. A lot of things that you suffer through is not because of the devil. It's because you don't know who you are. And this is what Paul is getting to. He, he, he wants to remedy, and, and that verse in 4, 6 in Hosea wants to remedy that, that Hosea declares to Israel in his day. Paul here wants to give the people, and I desire to give you knowledge, supernatural divine knowledge. Because when you know something, you're at an advantage. It, have you ever had some technology, sophisticated technology, and you just didn't know what to do? <laughs> and you had to call somebody, you know, a child, your, your son, your daughter, your grandchildren, honey, come help me with this. I'm, I'm one of them. You know, I had equipment at our church, sophisticated video equipment, audio equipment, and I, you ask me, I don't know because I didn't have the knowledge. See how important knowledge is? Just in, on an earthly plane, how much more 
in a heavenly place. So the first word, and I, I'm probably not going to get too much further than this, but the first word that Paul uses in verse number three, look at your Bible, is bless. And he is directing this blessing to God. Paul is praising God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So before everything else, and this is something to, 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 to note, before everything else, before the scripture speaks of what is yours, Paul is saying, bless. Yes. Yes. Paul is saying it is proper and in order to give God praise, worship, and thanksgiving above all else. Because he, and listen to this, Paul is not just using the, you know, the religious slang that we accumulate over the years, you know, uh, bless the Lord, you know, thank you, Jesus, he is risen, yes, he's risen indeed. You know what all them things we say? Paul is not using it in that context. Paul is saying one word out of a revelation. He's not saying that God is blessed. He's not blessing the Lord primarily. What he is stating to us, you need to get this, he is declaring who God is. God is the very essence of blessedness. He's not blessed. He is the very sum of the word. Are you, are you hearing me this morning? Yeah, he is blessed. Let me correct, but he, he's blessed because he is the very state of blessedness. Every blessing flows from the blessed one, the one whose essence is the very word. So Paul is 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 sharing from the, the deepest recesses of revelation. He's, he's, he's thinking about how he met Christ Jesus on the Damascus Road. He's thinking about how his life was turned around. He, he's thinking about all that he's used to be and now who he is now. And all that he can say is, Bless. Before he says anything else, bless be the God, our Father. And, and that's, that's powerful because that's what I was trying to get ready to say in the introduction. Can you bless God in every situation? Can you bless God when things are not going right? Are you in a relationship with the Father based on what he does for you instead of who he is? Paul could bless the Lord, him and Silas, in prison. He wasn't having a good time in prison, but he was still blessing the Lord because he knew that even being locked up, I serve a blessed God. Can you bless the Lord on your sick bed? Can you bless the Lord when your children acting like hell? Can you bless the Lord when you don't have any money? Because it's not about what he gives you. It's about who he is. And if you're going to bless him for what he's done, bless him for the salvation that you have received. And the reason we don't do that because we're so caught up in this world, you know, the things we need to live here and now for this twinkling of an eye time period compared to all eternity that God has reconciled you to. 
through Christ Jesus. Woo, Lord have mercy. So, so Paul says, blessed be the God from the depths of his soul out of the knowledge of him who gives, who, who comes authentic praise. See, if there is no praise coming from a Christian, and if I got to pump you up, if the music got to be just the way you like it, that's a good indication you don't have a real authentic knowledge of who God is. But some of y'all, and, and all of y'all are going to get there one day, but some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Anybody ever been riding down the interstate and the Holy Spirit just says something to you? <laughs> he just reminds you <laughs> how good God is. There ain't nobody in the car but you and the Holy Spirit. And you begin to bless the Lord. Out of revelation, not of what he did, but who he is. <laughs> and that's why he says, bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what he is saying, this is teaching us that all things come through Christ Jesus. And this had been planned from eternity past through the covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, pointing to a greater covenant that would be the ultimate covenant in Christ Jesus. In fact, God's love is so powerful. Before the world was put in place, before you were born, before you were known on earth, before you sinned, before the world sinned, before the foundation of the world and the council of the Trinity, it was determined that the Son, the Lord Christ Jesus, would pay for your sins. I love how the pastor reiterated the gospel this morning. I'm going to say this, and you need to hear me good. Don't you ever trivialize or get comfortable with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you, if, if the mystery of the gospel is not fascinating to you every day of your life, you've gotten too comfortable. Come on. There's nothing else that compares to that. There's nothing that compares to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you make anything more important than that, you do not value the knowledge and the exercise and the blessing that comes from Christ Jesus. And in our, our time uh, in, in this day and age, it's easy to get distracted with church stuff that takes your eyes off of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything we do should be out of a motivation and appreciation that before the foundation of the world, the Father knew me and put me in Christ Jesus, and now I have eternal reconciliation with him, and I will live in splendor, in excellence, in joy, in wholeness for all eternity. When I deserve the lake of fire and torment for all eternity. I ain't got time to preach about hell, but it's not a place you want to go. There's no escaping. There's no party there. You will be in extreme pain for all eternity. Unimaginable suffering that 
Every one of us, including me, deserved. The only thing that saved me was the precious blood of Jesus. Don't you get so accustomed to that reality that that doesn't excite you, that it doesn't stimulate thought and, and the mystery of how can a God that I've never seen love me so much? Jesus. So Paul, he blesses the Father. And I'll say this, and I'm going to start bringing this to a close. Worship should always come before the request. That's how you know you got revelation. Lord, as I get down here to pray and to talk to you, if you don't do nothing else for me, Father, you've already done enough. And I bless your name. I bless your name. Honor should always come. Honoring God should always come before you ask him. Nobody, no parent likes their child to just come and demand something from the parent I'm going to get real now because we live in that, that generation that thinks they're entitled. Does somebody know what I'm talking about in here? No parent likes to feel like their child is entitled to something they didn't work for just because. Every parent wants to be loved by their children. Every parent wants to be honored, and it is from that honor that brings favor. Come on, let's get real with each other. You, that child that is wayward, that child that is disrespectful, you may still give them grace, but you're not going to give them favor. So before... The request we worship, before we ask, we honor. Before supplication, we show gratitude. Before we bring our needs, we adore him. That's why in the scripture that Pastor Jones was sharing about the Passover this morning is so important because it goes on to say that when Moses came and got the instructions from God, God says, go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. That I have a place established for my covenant people Israel, a land flowing with milk and honey. But Note what the scripture says. He says, but before then, bring them out three days journey so they can worship me. Worship always comes before the milk and honey. If you're just going after the milk and honey, you will, you will not have the favor to reach the destination because you didn't stop and worship. All right, don't shout me down. And one thing I found out is that the people who complain the most, critique the most, try and influence others, others the most, are miserable and irritable the most, they can't control their anger, they're backbiters. These are people who are always thinking of themselves. But someone that praises God in good times and bad times is someone who's not thinking about themselves, but thinking about that personal revelation of God. The maturing Christian does not run after the blessing. You need to hear me right now. You need to hear me. 
The maturing Christian doesn't run after the blessing. He worships and praises the source, thereby possesses what is already his. Oh, boy. I know I'm laying it on thick this morning, but you got to get that. Authentic praise comes out of what you realize you already have, not what you're going to get. I got to say that again. Authentic worship and praise comes out of what you know you already have, not what you trying to get from God. And we waste too much time asking God to give us what we already possess. Because the word says, not only is God blessed, but he has blessed us with all, not in the future. He uses that word blessed in the past tense. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And this is what makes this verse so powerful. No matter what the world, no matter what the outside stimuli says to you, that would be your hearing, your touch, what you feel, what you taste. Regardless of any of that, any substance, God wants you to know you are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now, let me begin to end this. All blessings are yours in your possession right now. That should change your prayer life right, right there. Because like a lot of us, we get on our knees and we go down the list of things that we think we need. Instead of thank, see, this is it. Instead of thanking God for what we already possess. Shift. Look at your neighbor and say shift. Shift in your prayer life and begin to thank God for what you already possess. That will revolutionize your prayer life. And I'm going to end with this because it's coming to the end of the verse. He's not only blessed us with all sp spiritual blessings. He says spiritual blessings. Which means these are not earthly blessings. A nice car and I like them. <laughs> That's not a spiritual blessing. A nice house is not a spiritual blessing. And we need to redefine what a spiritual blessing is. That's not a spiritual blessing. That's an earthly blessing. You know? And I could go on and on. But what God has given you is some spiritual stuff. Stuff that is supernatural. The ability to come to him and worship him and ask of him. That's a spiritual blessing. You know why? Because everybody can't do it. In the Old Testament, women couldn't do it. Now he makes no distinction. The only qualifying factor is, are you in Christ Jesus? And if you are in Christ Jesus, you have all all spiritual blessings and he authenticates it by ending by saying this those blessings are secure because they're in heavenly places in Christ 
which means those blessings are not determined. Those blessings that you possess, those blessings that come to you, that manifest to you, they're not conditioned on you. They're not at risk because of you. Because if the blessing was determined by you and what you do, you would be at risk of losing them. So he ends by saying those spiritual blessings, those supernatural blessings, they're in a vault that you can access at any time. They're in heavenly places, and the vault is Christ Jesus. The Bible says that you have been blessed with every spiritual gift in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if they're in Christ Jesus, they cannot be lost. They cannot be altered. They cannot be worked for. You must just ex expect and live in the reality. I'm going to end by uh, illustrating it this way. <coughs> Think about how much money you got in the bank. And how that affects your thinking. If you don't have enough money in the bank, it's going to affect you. It's going to make you, it's going to motivate you, hopefully, to get up and go get some more money so you can have a little, little money in the bank. Because what you have in the bank determines how you think. Now, if you don't believe me, Wake up tomorrow morning and discover you got $10 million in your bank account. <laughs> that would not only, hear me, that would not only change the way you think, it would change the way you live. Because you would see yourself different based on what you possess. That is what Paul is trying to get you to see this morning. You have unlimited blessings that belong to you in a safe place. And when you wake up in the morning, I don't know whether to run or shout or what, but when you wake up in the morning and realize, I got all spiritual blessings in heavenly places secured in Christ. It should change the way you think. It should change the way you act. And it should change how you interact with other people in this world. Father, thank you for this blessed word. One verse. 23 words that unlocks so many possibilities, so many blessings into our lives. Holy Spirit, seal this word in the spirit of your people. When they're going through, remind them to worship God. When they're experiencing challenges, remind them to praise God because they are blessed with all blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus because our God is the very essence of being blessed. Speak a blessing over this house. The blessing that I speak, Lord, is that they realize that they are already blessed and will begin to live in the act in a manner that reflects that reality. In Jesus' name, amen. You know
know, when I was praying, the Lord was saying, he said, now, look at your neighbor and say, shift. No, don't do this one. <laughs> Y'all are praying for your new church building. Stop praying for the new church building and start praising God for the new church building. Because that's one of the spiritual gifts, is a place of excellence to worship him and to present. That's your possession. That is something you don't have to ask for. That's something you thank God for, even though you don't see it. You ain't never seen God, but you bless his name. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for your prayers. When the Holy Spirit brings Henry Joseph to mind, just say bless him and keep him and prosper him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, encourage Bishop Joseph. Come on, encourage Bishop Joseph. Amen. Hallelujah. What a word. Amen. Did y'all enjoy that? Amen. Amen. It's okay. Go ahead. It's okay. It's okay. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, uh, I, I was just sitting there listening to him. And now look how the Lord has blessed me. We, you know, the thing that God really showed me, brother, is that this. He don't start us out on top. It's just part of the journey. And he worked us through to learn, and, and, and he made this clear to me. He, he teaches us how to worship him while we're going through. Because the worship part helps you recognize it wasn't you. It was God that did it for you, you know, uh, and I'm grateful, you know, we, we, you know, I'm just grateful to the Lord to be connected to people like this. Let, let, let me say this in another way. The Bible says iron sharp and iron. You need people in your life that makes you better. say this and I don't mean no in a negative way but you don't need to always run with animals that have fleas on them. You need to learn how to run with people that don't have the fleas so you can elevate to that level and become what God called you to be. And when you experience that then you see the difference between the two spheres. I'm grateful that I'm not what I used to be. And I'm grateful that he's not through with me yet. Did you hear me? Thank God for his grace and thank God for his mercy. But thank God for sending people like this through your pastor's life. Because they give me a vision of where God wants to take me. Because he connected with same revelation and look at him now look at him now this man y'all just don't know half his brother's story i'm telling you you don't know half his story and he and listen as i close with this thought when we were in in israel together living in the same room together this this brother he shared something and i was like wow just just the experience of bunking you know back in the day that's what they called it bunking you go you who's your bunker the person we can stayed in room. I bunk with this brother. It was just God connecting me to people of this magnitude because he see and saw where he wanted.
supposed to take your pastor. And that's not arrogance at all. That's understanding what God is doing in your life. And you walk in that anointing to become what God calls you to be. Come on, encourage Bishop Joseph one more time. He's worthy. We thank God for those who have watched our program, our service on this morning. Our prayer is, is that something has been granted and said that will shift you in this season, that will cause you to become what God is instructing you to be. Does it happen overnight? No. It's part of the process. And when you trust God in the process and allow him to work through you and allow him to develop you, you can become everything that God has called for you to become and be because the blessing is upon you. The favor of God is upon you. Hold them, ushers. Hold them, ushers. Hold them at the door, ushers. The blessing of God is upon you. And our prayer is from triumphant that you have received this word and that God has spoken so profoundly into your spirit on this day that you are better as a result of watching this word, hearing this word, and receiving it into your heart. Our prayer is that you would never be the same, but you would be something totally different as God progresses and moves you into the new world. God bless you. Until we meet again, may he forever keep you, may he forever guide you, and may he forever allow you to recognize you are triumphant because of what Jesus has already done for you. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, encourage them, triumphant. Come on, encourage them.